Welcome to Training Without Travel, Idea Software Training via Practical Application, presented jointly by AuditNet and Richard Cascarino and Associates. This webinar is part of the Training Without Travel series covering Idea Software. This webinar today will cover the Conducting Basic Data Analysis with Idea. I'm Jim Kaplan founder and owner of AuditNet, and I will be moderating the webinar. Joining us is Richard Cascarino, principal of Cascarino & Associates, who will provide you with an overview of how to get started with the data analysis software from Caseware. This course covers the major functions which are in everyday use by the auditor in any use of IDEA and which forms the basis of advanced audit techniques. Let me have Richard introduce himself and give you a brief overview of his background, and then I'll cover some of the housekeeping items for today's webinar. Richard. Thanks, Jim. Uh, my name is Richard Cascarino, as Jim said, and I'm the principal of Richard Cascarino and Associates, based out of Colorado. Um, although I'm based in Colorado, at the moment I'm in South Africa, so this webinar is actually coming to you from South Africa. My background, I've got some 30 years experience in IT auditing, training and consultancy. I'm a past president of the Institute of Internal Auditors in South Africa, a member of ASACA, a member of the ACFE, and I'm the author of the Auditor's Guide to IT Auditing, which I believe hit Amazon today. So that's me up to date. Well, very good. Let me go ahead and just uh, cover some of the housekeeping items for today's webinar. We are recording this webinar and it will be made available to all participants within 48 hours after the conclusion via an email notification. We kindly request that everyone fill out the brief online evaluation questions that you will see at the conclusion of the webinar. Your feedback is very valuable, so please take a minute or two to complete the survey. In addition, because this webinar qualifies for CPE credits, we will be putting up polling questions in compliance with NASVA rules. Those answering the questions will receive their CPE certificate by email within 7 to 10 days. You will have an opportunity both during and at the end of the webinar to ask questions. Submit your questions during the presentation via the chat box at the lower right-hand box on your screen. Simply type your question and press return to send it. Any question we're unable to answer, will we will, uh, by the end of the webinar, we will uh, answer directly via email within 48 hours. As moderator, I will be launching the poll, showing the results, and monitoring any questions. At this point, I would like to turn the floor over to Richard to introduce the agenda and begin with today's uh, webinar. Richard? Thank you, Jim. Just to take you through the agenda for today and what we're planning to cover, We'll be looking at summarizing of data, stratifying data, and viewing the results either as a printout or as a graph. We'll also look at creating pivot tables and then joining databases and some of the complexities in actually linking databases together. We'll have a look at reviewing the history and we'll look at displaying all records containing, so all records containing a certain amount, all records containing a certain date, whichever it happens to be from an audit perspective. We'll also look at performing record extractions, identifying duplicate invoices, and identifying gaps in invoice number sequence. Now we'll be using invoices as an example, but obviously it applies to anything that we're interested in. It could be purchase orders, it could be any particular item. Then we'll look at performing a key value extraction and we'll finish up by looking at performing record extractions using one of the uh, functionalities contained within IDEA. What we're going to do, you've got the slides in front of you. I'm going to now drop out of these slides and I'm going to switch across into IDEA. So if you'd like to fire up your IDEA and work along with me. And as you can see, I have brought up IDEA. Okay, if in any doubt, just go and start the programs and start up IDEA. We'll then need to set the working folder. In this case, I've already set it. 
But the working folder is the folder which will then contain all of the data files, any equations, views, uh, import definitions, etc. Together with anything that we want to add, like comments, etc., regarding what we find. And we'll take a look at uh, putting some comments in as we go. It's important to have that folder uh, set up appropriately because as we go, we can retain that as part of our working papers. So within that, we've got all of the definitions of what the data looked like when we got it. And as you'll see when we look at the history, how we obtained that information and what we did to it and which version of what we're looking at and whether we filtered anything out. Now, it may not be that critical to maintain that right now, but if you have to come back to this in six months' time, that can be very critical. If this becomes part of a fraud investigation and you have to supply information to court, it could take two years before it comes to court and you're going to need to know exactly what happened when you did um, these particular exercises. As I say, I'm already set up, but to set up the working folder, we'd simply go in and say file, set working folder. And in this case, I'm using the one called samples. In your case, it would be whatever your username is, my documents, idea, samples. And as you can see, I have certain files already set up in that. OK. Now, obviously, if we're going to use idea to perform various analyses and to extract data, then we have to get some hold of some data in order to do that analysis on. So what we're going to do is bring in a file. For those of you who were here on the first two webinars, um, this should be simply a refresher to you. But just to get us back in the mood again, we're going to go into File, Import Assistant, and Import to Idea. Okay. And the file that we're going to bring in will be a text file. So we're going to bring in a text file from the Tutorials folder, which you should have. And the file we're looking for is called sales.txt. When I bring it in, it's telling me it's a delimited, sorry, it's not a delimited file, it's a fixed length file, and it thinks it's coming from a PC, it's an ASCII file. If it was coming in as an IPSIDIC file, it should recognize it as that. It would not look like what's on the screen if it was an IPSIDIC file. It would simply look like that if it was IPSIDIC. The fact that it's looking like that just now tells me that's an ASCII file. Okay. Now, what we need to do is now define all of the fields within that file. We could change our record length, we could change our decimal symbols, we could change our thousands, etc. I'm simply going to say next, and it says there's my fixed record length 42. Now, I haven't told it this, it has calculated that by looking at it. It could be wrong. If we're dealing with variable length files, variable length records in the files, then that is possible to be wrong. It's not cast iron guarantee, but if I increase that 42 to 43, you'll see I now have a diagonal. If I drop it back to 41, I've got a diagonal going the other. Rough rule of thumb, if I've got vertical columns, it's probably picked up the file length correctly. So now we need to define the fields. And as with any other audit, if you're looking at running cats, the first thing we need is the file layout. Now that sounds very straightforward. Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. I've had the experience of going to an IT division and asking them for the file layout and they didn't have one. The system was so old, it was 20 odd years old. There was no records, there was no source code, nobody knew what the data meant. They just knew that it processed and that was fine. Problem was, they could not, under any circumstances, change that system 
because they had no documentation for it. They didn't know what to do to it. So I can look at this and I can see that those positions in the middle are saying Amex Visa, etc. So that looks like a payment type. I can see that over here we have an amount. And that might be all that I need to go ahead with my investigation as an auditor. I can also see that in there there's something that looks like a date. So maybe that's a date. Now in fact we can have the file layout, you have it in front of you. So we can go ahead and actually define all of the fields within this. You'll see when I move to next, Import Assistant has tried to identify the field delineators. In other words, where it thinks a field ends. Sometimes it gets it right, sometimes it gets it wrong. What it's basically looking for is where any changes occur or do not occur. You'll see there that we have a line after the first number, number one, and that's wrong. We know that initially we have an invoice number running from one to seven. To get rid of the line, that field delimiter, I can simply double click and it's gone. Single click will bring it back, double click takes it away. And I can see that now I've got from 1 to 7, and you'll see I've got column 7 there. So I know that I've got the correct field. The next one is my date, and I can see I've got an extra line there. So again, I'll double click and remove that. And I've now got 2006.0721, which is correct. Then comes my payment type, which is correct. Then comes a three-digit salesman. Now, I don't have a line for the three-digit salesman, but if I click in there, I now have a line. There's my three-digit salesman. Next one is six digits for my customer number. And again, I'm sitting with a six-digit customer number. Actually, I'm not. I'm sitting with a seven-digit, uh, sorry, sorry, with a five-digit customer number. So I've made a mistake. To get rid of it, I simply double-click to remove it, click again to put it back in. Everyone with me so far? Now anyone who's actually alert will note that in actual fact the one two sorry the two one two five four was in fact my five digit number. So it was in fact correct. Once again there's no big deal I can take it out I can put it back in the right place. So I can carry on doing that until I've got the layout the way it tells me. Critical element to bear in mind, if they have given you a file layout, I have given you a file layout here, the file layout may not be correct. It may not be up to date. They may have, for example, moved from a two-digit product code to a three-digit product code, but the file layout is still showing it's a two-digit. So when you get the data, always check to make sure the bit in here looks as though it makes sense compared to the record layer that you have been given. We're happy. So we can say next. Okay. Now I need to tell it what each of these fields are. I know that the first one is my invoice number, so I can simply say INV number. It is numeric. There are no decimal places, so I can move on to the next one. And my next one is my transaction date. So I can call it transaction date. Okay, But it's not a character field. This is a date field. So I need to change that from character to date. And having told it it's a date field, I now need to tell it what type of date field it is. Is it year, year, month, month, day, day, or what? Now in this case we know, because it's on our record layout, that it's year, 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 month, month, day, day. We can also look at the data, pick one of those and say, yep, that's a month, month, and a day, day. So if I did it the other way around and said day, day, month, month, it's not going to work. Okay, I can see up here that's what it's going to look like, so I can move on to my next field. And my next field is my payment type. And again, it says it's character. I check my layout. Yes, it's character, so 
I'm happy with that. I can move on to the next one. This is my salesman. Numeric, zero decimal places. We're happy with that. The next one should be my customer number. Also numeric. Also, no decimal places. The next one up is my product code. Also numeric. Although in actual fact, in this case, it's not numeric. This is a character field. And it's critical that if it's a character field, you define it as a character field. The fact that you wish that they'd given you a numeric field is beside the point. If it is a character field, we need to define it as a character field. Then I can move on to my amount and I can simply type in. But now I know if you look under converted example it says 431. I can see there it's 431.28. So we've actually got two decimal places there. And now it's coming out correctly so now I can say next. At this point if I wish I could add other fields. I don't have to, but I can. Since I don't need to, I'll say next. If I wanted to filter the data, I'm importing this information on sales, but I might only want it for one particular product type. I can click on what looks like a little calculator, which is in actual fact the equation editor, and then say I wanted to filter it based on the salesman less than this or the product code equal to that or whatever. In this case, I don't particularly want to, so I'll leave that. With the equation editor, you've got a big green tick which says I want it as it is and a big red cross which says I'm finished. I don't want this. So I'll cancel that. I'll tell it next. It says, OK, now what do you want to do? You've defined what the record looks like. How are you going to use this information when it comes in? Do I simply want to link to that data file or do I want to import that data file straight in? Now, for speed purposes, I might want to link it. There's a problem from an audit perspective if you link the definition to a data file because if that data file changes, if that's a live data file and it moves on, then I am not going to be able to reproduce my results if anyone asks how did you come to that conclusion. So generally, and particularly if it's a forensic investigation, I'm going to import the data and bring it down onto my machine so that I can interrogate it from there. I'm going to import it, I'm going to generate some field statistics, and I'm going to call the database sales transactions. And when everyone's done that, then we'll say finish. I'll give you a couple of seconds to catch up. If you want me to run rapidly through it again, these were all of the fields that we set up. Our invoice number was numeric. Our date we set up as a date field. Our payment type was character. Our salesman was numeric, our customer was numeric, our product code was character field, and our amount was numeric but with two decimal places. We did not add any additional fields, we did not want to filter anything out, and we do want to generate field statistics, and the database name is going to be called Sales Transactions. And when I'm happy with all of that, I'll say finish. Now, in my case, I've already done it, so I'm going to replace the file. And there are all of my sales transactions, invoice number, transaction date, payment type, salesman, etc. I am now ready to start my investigations. And at this point, I think we're at the first polling question. So I'll hand it back to Jim. I will go ahead and launch the poll. 
Okay, the poll is now open. To import the sales file, the appropriate format was print format, XML, text, or access. So go ahead and uh, vote. We will go ahead and close the poll. At this poll. point, we'll find out if anyone's been listening. Exactly. And we will share the results. Text. Yeah. We could have brought it in from a print report, from XML, from anything else. The reason we brought it in from text, that's what they gave us. And wishing that they'd given us something different doesn't make it any easier, I'm afraid. Very good. We'll go ahead and we will hide the results. And Richard, you can carry on. Okay. Okay. So we now have our data. Question is, what are we going to do with this data? Well, typically the first thing we want to do is just take our sales transaction file and do some summarization on it. So we'll go into our analysis up at the top on our menus, and we're going to do some summarization first one that's on there. And it says, okay, what do you want to summarize and how do you want to summarize it? Well, we want to summarize, we don't want to summarize by invoice number, we want to summarize by customer number. So we'll click on the arrow at the side and we'll pick the customer number. And that's all. We don't want anything within customer number so we can leave the next one. As far as the fields that we want to total, there's no point in totaling the invoice numbers of the salesman. So we'll just total the amount. Okay. What it's going to do for us is it's going to create a separate database file with a single record for each one of those customers showing the total amount per customer. We could, if we want, include the percent, but in actual fact we're quite happy with what we've got. So I'm going to change the name down at the bottom to summarized Instead of summarization, I'm going to make it summarized transactions. Obviously, you can make it named anything you want. I'm using summarized transactions simply because that keeps me in line when I want to clear everything out before the next uh, training course that we run. OK. If I say OK now. We can see there's my customer numbers, there's the number of records, and there's the amount summarized. If I want to look at the detail on that, there's no point looking at that one because there is only one. But I could come down to record number 11 where there are seven of them. And if I want to see which seven, simply clicking on that will show me the seven. So I can see the invoice numbers for those seven for that customer, transaction date, how it was paid, who the salesman was, customer number, product code, etc. I could, if I want, print it. But in this case, I'm finished with it, so I'll just say done. I think if I wanted to look at that one down here, if I simply click on it, there are all of the ones for that particular customer. Customer number 11600. And you can see that this one is buying a mixture of product codes, product code 3, product code 5, etc. If I look at the one on its own, I'm only going to get the one record, because that's all there was. OK. We're looking at the summarized transaction file at the moment. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask the system to create some field statistics for me. And if you were on the earlier ones, you'll remember that all I have to do is go over to the Properties window and simply click on Field Statistics. It says they're not available for all fields. Do I wish to create statistics for all fields which don't have them at the moment? Yes, I do. And you can see it's created a total net value for customer number. Well, that doesn't make sense, so we'll get rid of that one. Total of number of records, that doesn't really make sense either, so we'll get rid of that one. Because what I'm really interested in is the amount summary. 
OK. And I can see there some critical information. I can see the net value. I can see the absolute value is the same as the net value. Right away, that tells me there are no negatives. The absolute value is the total of negative plus positive as if they were all positives. It's the complete number between the lowest and the highest. I've got 303 records. That ties with what I have down here, a number of records. I've got one zero item. That could be interesting. If I click on that one, there's my zero item. That's the customer number. They've got one record. And so far, they seem to have bought zero. There's my positive values, my negative values. If I had any negatives, I could click on there and immediately see which ones were negatives. 302 positives, 303 valid, so I've got positives plus zero, plus one zero. The average value, the maximum value. Ooh, there's someone with a big invoice. Three million. That's interesting. That's because he's got 35 orders that he's placed already. So that might make sense. I'm quite happy with that. And I can have a look at all of these, and I can have a look at the sample, standard deviation of sampling etc. Not much value at the moment, but when we come into the webinar that looks at stati statistical sampling, that would be critical. Okay, so when we're happy on that, I'm going to move out of field statistics and go back to data. Simply clicking on data takes me straight back to it. I'll pick a record, I'll pick that one again, number seven, but this time I'm going to right click and when I right click, I can say, show me the field stats. And it says, these are all the fields that we've got. Numeric fields, date fields, etc. What do you want to show? Well, I'm only interested in numeric. So I want to show the net value. I'll show the absolute values. I'll show the minimum value. And I'll show the maximum value. Just those four. And if I say OK now, comes up at the top. And again, I can pick up, same as I would in anything in Windows, I can pick that up and slide it out. And I can see there's my ultimate, uh, sorry, my absolute value, uh, number of records, etc. Maximum, minimum, net values, the lot. Okay. When I'm finished with it, I can remove it again simply by right-clicking any record and say that I want to um, clear off all of those field statistics. So I'll go into show field statistics and this time I'm going to say clear all. That's them gone. Okay. Everyone happy with that, hopefully. Again, on our analysis, I can go into analysis and I can choose, instead of summarization, I can choose stratification. And this time, I can stratify the information. And the field I want to stratify on of these ones is going to be the number of records. And you can see up here we've got an increment. So I'm going to say, make that 10,000, 5,000. Whoops, not 50,000, 5,000. And that will plug it in there. And if I then take that down to row 5, it's going to stratify my data on 1 to 5,000, 5,001 to 10,001, etc. I can then change change that on 6 and make that 25,000 instead of 5,000. So it's now going to go from 25,000. Let me change that. I want to remove that one. And now if I go down to here, 
you'll see I'm 25,000 to 50,000. And I'll take it from there all the way down to number 12. Because I know that's the highest that I'm going to come across. Again, I'm going to create a separate field and I'm going to give it the number numeric stratification. and say OK. I must select at least one numeric field for each stratum. So what I've done is I've told it I want to stratify on that. I've told it what the ranges are going to be, but I haven't told it what I want to actually look at. And what I want to look at is the sum of the amounts. So it's kind of clever. If you try and make a mistake, or if you accidentally make a mistake, it will tell you you've slipped up. So now we have our full classification, and I can see it's all sitting in there. If I want to see it in a bit more clarity, I can go up to my button bar and look at Print Preview. I'm not going to print it because then I'd have to hold it up to the camera and let you see it. But that's my Print Preview. So there's my summary Transactions stratified on number of records, 12 strata specified, these are the limits on them, and it shows me where the bulk of them are sitting, they're fairly low items, low value items, and there's nothing above that. Okay. If there was anything below zero, if there were any negatives, it would come up as a lower limit exception. If there was anything over 200,000, it would come up as an upper limit exception. But in actual fact, it's telling me that everything I've got is sitting one to five thousand. I don't have any customer who's placed more than five thousand transactions. So I'll close that down. Which brings us rather nicely to polling question number two. Very good, Richard. We'll go ahead and we will launch the second polling question. To display the field statistics beside the data, you should one, click on field statistics. Two, right-click on a record and show, choose Show Field Statistics. Three, right-click on a record, then click on Field Statistics. And four, left-click on a record, then click on Field Statistics. That's a real tongue twister. <laughs> okay. Done deliberately. Done deliberately. Okay, we'll leave the polling open for another 10 seconds or so. And we will go ahead and... Close the poll, share the results, click on field statistics. Nope. Okay. If you remember, if I go back into data, what I did was I went in and I clicked on show field statistics. Remember, if I wanted to click on field statistics, it would show you it here. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to add it onto data, to show it beside the data. So if I went in here on any of these and said show field statistics, I can pick the ones I want to do, net value, absolute value, and it shows it beside my data. Okay. Very good. Okay, very good. Carry on. Get rid of it. I'll simply go back in and show field statistics again and cancel it out. Perfect. Okay. It may not sound like a big deal, but if I want to show, to print that information, including those field statistics, I need it in that data area. Then I can print it. So I'll take those summarized transactions, and I'm going to go back and look at that numeric summarization, stratification rather, that we did just by clicking on it. Okay. And I'm going to go instead this time, I'm going to go and look at this in terms of graphs. If you look at where we've got those results, above the top of it there's a little mini button bar. On the left hand side it says put it into a graph. So if I put it into a graph, there it is. 
Now at the moment, that's not really giving us a hell of a lot. So what I'll do is I'll close that down and go back into my data. And instead of doing it and classifying it and stratifying it by um, number of records, I'm going to stratify it by amount. So I'll go into analysis and I'll stratify. Instead of doing it by the number of records, I'm going to stratify on the amount and I'm going to add up the number of records. We'll make that 5,000 again. Whoops, 50. 5,000. And run it through. And then I'll change that to 25,000. You can see there I'm sitting with 5,000 when I should have actually had that as 25,000. And then run it from there. And what is this telling us? It's telling us that it's so easy to make a mistake, but so easy to correct it. Now you can see you've got a whole pile of different numbers. And that's a critical one when you're doing these and you're trying to analyze and you're wanting to uh, do stratification, particularly stratification. You've got to stratify it the right way around. If you stratify it by numbers or amount, you're going to get one record in this case. If you stratify it by amount, for records, it's going to say for each of these amounts, these are the number of records. And you can see we've got numeric stratification, and we've got stratification now. Now if I click on my graph, you can see all of the different categories. For amounts from 0 to 5,000, I've got that number. I've got 219, which fit into that category. For amounts, 175,000. To there. I can look in here, there's nothing, but there is something over that upper limit. And if I want to double click on it, I can actually display the field statistics, or I can pull it up and look at it. I can also from here look at different types of graph. I can change the colors. Let's have a look at the gallery, third one in. And I can look at that by, for example, a pie chart or a ring chart. Rather. I can say I don't like that particular ring chart. Show it to me as a three-dimensional ring chart. And if I want, I can rotate it. I can go back and change any of these colors. I can go back in to my gallery and say I don't want it as a ring chart, I want it shown with that kind of chart. I can say I don't want it with that one. How do you choose a chart? If you're going to use graphics, how do you decide which way you're going to show it? The critical element is what is going to get your message across to the auditee in the clearest form. That one shows an immediate spike. So I can see immediately we've got something there. But it kind of fizzles out down the end. And I really have lost visibility of that one very high item. So perhaps in looking at it, maybe the best one I could actually go with would be taking it back out of 2D and taking it back into a straightforward line chart where it's actually showing us that things are moving or I could take it from there and put it straight back into my vertical bar chart and show it that way.
and that way I can see there is something there which may need further investigation. Okay, so there's a temptation when you've got the capability of manipulating and coming out with really fancy graphs, three-dimensional ring charts or pie charts or whatever you want, to go for it. At the end of the day, you're putting a chart in your audit report in order to produce an effect. You're trying to show what you have found. And therefore, it's a question of selecting which one you want that's going to give the best impact. Again, I can go in and I can change my palette. I can go in and change my axis setting. I can change my y-axis grid. I can change my, um, if I go in my y-axis and look at the grid on that one, I can change the meaning of it. I can change the strata of it, etc. It's grid. I could make it interlaced. I could change the vertical labels. I could change the horizontal labels. Whatever it happens to be that I want. Okay. Or I could simply go down here and move over that, click on it, and say, "Show me the records." And these are the records that make up that. If I want to know what that one is there the very high value one, that's way out of the strata, there is there, that's that one customer who's got 35 transactions with us for 3 million. Now I may want to go back in out of my summarized data and go back into my sales data and look for that information for that customer and find out what they are and what he's been buying and why we've been charging that, etc. Okay, when we're happy with all of that, to close it down, we can simply go into Window and say Close All. And it's wiped everything out of here. It's still all there, and I can still get back to it. If I bring in my summarized data, I still have my numeric stratification, my stratification. I've got my indices that I've built. At the moment, we're working with no index. And again, I could shut it down simply from here. Or I can go in and say, Windows, close the lot. OK, everybody happy, I hope. <laughs> Let's take a look at pivot tables. Now, pivot tables, a lot of people look at pivot tables and say, well, what are they, and how can they be of any benefit to me as an auditor? So let's pick up our sales transaction database. We're back to all that detail, all 900 transactions. We've got it by customer, by invoice, by tra we don't know how we've got it. We've got a mixture. Okay. So what we can do is if I want to analyze this, I can go into analysis and tell it I want to create a pivot table. And I'm going to leave the results I'm going to call it the sales transaction pivot table. In this case, we're only going to create one, but we may have multiples. Pivot table. And now we can see what we've got. We've got up here a list of fields, and up here we've got columns, rows, and data items. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I want to take my payment type, which is here, I'm going to drag it over and put it into the drop columns field here. And that's it there. So I've got my Amex, my Cash, my Visa, etc. I'm then going to take my product code and I'm going to drop it into my drop rows here. And these are all the different product codes that we sell. Now I can say, take my amount and drop it into my data items. And if I close that, I can now stretch these out so that I can see what I'm doing here. Whenever you get, it's the same as Excel, whenever you get hash signs, it means 
that it's, the field is too big to fit in what's on the screen, so you need to stretch things out a little. And you can see here the Amex product code one, this is what was bought, that was what was bought with cash, that was what was bought with Visa, etc. Now I could have done it the other way around, I could have put Amex, Visa and cash on this side and product code along there. You can set it up any way you want, but basically what you've done in three clicks is you've taken a vast amount of data and created yourself an Excel spreadsheet out of it. Okay, and therefore you can make more sense out of it. And that brings us to the third polling question. Okay, and I will go ahead and launch polling question three. To produce a pivot table, you need column rows, row fields, and data items, column items, row fields, and data fields, column fields, row fields, and data fields, or column items, row items, and data items. You really need to uh. read these carefully, don't you, Richard? <laughs> you do. I would not actually expect you to have memorized it instantly, but once you've been through it a few times, then what you realize, I'll better wait till it's finished. Okay, and what is the answer? Along the top, you're going to have your column fields, down the side you're going to have your row fields, and in the middle you're going to have your data items, so it's number one. Okay, and spot on, that's what our, uh, our audience said, 100%, wonderful, perfect. Yeah, I will go ahead and hide okay. those, and then you can carry on. Okie doke. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close down again my pivot table. So I'm going to go into Windows and close all. It's gone. Okay. Again, if I click on that uh, sales transactions, oops. I bring in sales transactions again. You can see we've got all of this and we now have our sales transaction pip table. So it's there when we need it, but it's not there when we don't need it. So I'll close that down again. And what we're going to do now is take a look at joining databases. And there's a couple of different ways you can join databases. Um, I'll show you what happens when you get it right and I'll show you what happens when you get it wrong. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in, through my import assistant, but this time what I'm going to import to IDEA is a Microsoft Access file, which is sitting again in that tutorial um, set, and it's the customer database. And I'll say next. Is data set one or database one. So within that, there could have been multiples that I wanted to bring in, but in actual fact, I only want to bring one in, so I'm happy with that. And you'll see that unlike the other one where I had to define all of these fields, whack, it's brought it all in. Okay. Are we happy? Now within this, you can see we've got the customer number, the first name, the last name, the country, the status, and the credit limit. On our sales transactions, if I bring that in, we had, hey, we had the customer number as well. So we should be able to link that customer number to that customer number in order to take all of those transactions and get hold of the customer's name, country, credit limit, etc. Does that sound reasonable? I hope. But there's a problem. Because if you remember when we defined this, if I go in on my data and take a look at field manipulation, down here you'll see that my customer number is numeric. If on the other hand I look at my customer database and I look at my customer number, you'll find that my customer number is character and I cannot tie the two character 
to numeric. So if I went in on file at this stage and said I want to join databases, it's going to ask me what fields do I want to join. I'll take lot. Okay. What key am I going to join it on? And right now, I don't have anything that I can join it on because I don't have a common key. So if I said that I wanted to match, there's nothing to match. So I'm going to have to cancel out of that. And I'm going to have to go into my sales transaction. And now I'm going to have to redefine that in order to get an alphabetic customer number so that I can match the two on it. So if I go into my data and on my field manipulation, there's my customer number and it's numeric. I'm going to change that to character. And it warns me, making changes to the database through field manipulation can cause anything based on that field, totals, results, indexes, all appear to be incorrect or invalid. You can make it again, valid again by going back to what there was before you changed it. Do we want to change it? Yes, we do. So we now have that. And I'm going to say, now I can go and say I want to go into file and I want to join my databases. Okay. And I can see that on the fields, I have still got everything selected. So I'm happy with that. Now I'm going to tell it which file I want to connect to, or which database. And I'm going to connect it to the customer database. OK. Now, I could tell it that I want only certain fields on there, but I'm happy with that. I'll take all of the fields. I want to match. Now, what can I match? You saw that this time, match was highlighted. So now I can go in and I say I want to match on my customer number against my customer number. They've all got to be specified to match keys. So right away I've got a problem because although I have those fields, I need to go in and say I want my customer number or my other customer number and now it's letting me do it. I hadn't told it whether it was ascending or descending or how I wanted it sorted because remember what I said? We don't know which order this file's in. I could sort them or I could index them but in fact I'll let the machine do it for me. I'm going to take Matches only, records with no secondary match, records with no primary match. I'm going to take all records in both files, okay, because I want to look at those separately later on. And if I say OK now, there we have all of the information that came in from a sales transaction file. And now you'll see I've got customer number here and I've got customer number one over here. And it's done the match between those two. Okay. So now I can see my customer number and I could, if I want, go and pick up my country and drag, oops, pick up my country and drag it over there. And I could pick up the credit limit and drag that over there and pick up the status and drag that over there. So I now have my customer number, sorry, status, I will put it over there. So I can see my customer number, the country, etc. And I can move it around and manipulate it any way I want. Okay. So we've done our match and we've got our file. You'll see that the file is now called join because I didn't give it a name. I probably should have given it a name. So I'll rename it. And in this case I'll call it customer balances. If 
file is unused, is in use or locked, so I can't change it while it's open. So I need to close it, and then I can change it. It's just slightly more helpful than having to go back and do it again. There's an easy way to go back and do it again, but we'll cover that later on in the webinar series. So I'll just change that to customer balances. And now I can bring it up as customer balances. And you'll see there we have 900 sales transaction files, but we've got 943 customer balance files. We've got some customers who are on one file but not on the other. Let me bring those two customer codes, the customer number and customer number one. Whoops. side by side. And I can see immediately that there are some items where we have got customers, but we don't have customer number one. Now, customer number one was coming from my customer database one. Okay. So in other words, we've sold to people who aren't on our customer database. So we've got a slight problem here. I can go if I want and look at my history. And within that, I can see this is what we did. We took our sales transactions, if I explode it. We did our file import, that's how we imported it. We brought in 900 records, that was where it came from, that's what we called it. And that's the actual script code that IDEA used to create that. Now. Again, we'll look at this later on down the line, but we can take that script code, copy it, put it into a batch file, and then we could run this every month if we wanted. We looked at the database, and we indexed it by customer number ascending. Remember it said it didn't work when it wasn't in the right order, there was no key that matched, I had to make it ascending first. We created a pivot table on this on our customer balance file. We did a remove and replace files. We joined files and this is how we joined the file. And we can see in there we had five unmatched primary records and we had 43 unmatched secondary records. Now what that's telling us is we've got five sales transactions with no associated customer, authorized customer. And we've got 43 customers who have not got any sales transactions, which is fair enough. They haven't bought anything this month. So we can look at any of these sections. We can look particularly at them. And again, you can see we've got 346 records that were matched, but we've only got 341 that came out as matched. We've got five unmatched ones. Okay. Happy? I'll go back into my data. If I wanted to, if I go back into that history, and I'm sitting here with my database information, I could, if I wanted, add a comment. And I can add a comment quite simply by saying I want to add. And the comment I want to add is um, unauthorized sales. Sales to five customers. Or sales to five unauthorized customers, whichever way you want to put it. When I'm happy, you can see I'm happy with that. I've added it, and I can close that down. And you can now see we've got a comment there that if I was looking at this as working papers six months down the line, this is what I found. How did I get to that? Oh, yeah, there it is there. Let me look at the history. And I can look back through it and find why I came to that conclusion. 
Okay. Time for me to relax and you to have another question. Okay, Richard, we will go ahead and we will launch poll number four. To join databases, the key fields must be always character, always numeric, either character or numeric, or always the same. You would go ahead and vote right now. We'll leave the poll open for about 30 seconds or so. We've gotten uh, responses coming in very quickly here. And we will go ahead now and close the poll, share the results. Always the same. Correct. It doesn't Excellent. have to be character, it doesn't have to be numeric, but they must match. Very good. Okay. Otherwise, it's not going to give you the results you expect. Excellent. Okay. Continue on. Moving on. I'm going to go back up to my data, okay, which takes me back to the data and that customer balance. And if I look at down here, we're sitting with there's no value in customer number one. Now in your records it says number nine, I've got it nothing in number ten, okay, because I've got them in a slightly different order. So if I right click on that blank field, I can now say display all records containing, and there's two quotations, in other words, display all records containing a space in that character. Okay. And if I say OK, these are the five records. They've come from different salesmen, we've got different customers. We've got a product code that was sold and we've got the amount that was sold. And we can see the invoice numbers and the transaction dates and they were paid by different credit cards. But these were payments to customers who theoretically at least don't exist. So, do we have a fraud going, or do we just have someone who is bypassing our authorized customer procedure? We don't know from this, it doesn't tell us. It tells us we have an abnormality, and we need to go and check. Again, I can right click in the properties and look at the criteria. And in that, I can clear that. And now if I go into my customer number, instead of customer, um, customer number one, if I pick up record 66, in my case, which are no customer number. And I say again, all of these. Now it's showing all of the customers who did not actually buy anything. So no payments have been made or no purchases have been made, depending on whether I'm looking at the sales uh, purchase or the sales payment file. So again, I need to find out which file I'm looking at. And again, if you look down at the bottom, you'll see number of records, 43 out of 493. We've got 43 customers with no outstanding balance. It's the kind of thing that periodically you might want to do, where you're looking for, for example, um, employee numbers working for a department code that doesn't exist. Now, why would somebody want to work for a department code that doesn't exist? Well, typically what happens is that if payment is being made by cash, the pay clerk gets given all of the pay envelopes or makes up the pay envelopes for the different uh, departments and then sends them out to the departments. If there's a department that doesn't exist, that goes into the, his pocket, perhaps. Now, if I wanted to do a check, typically what I would do is I would print from the payment side payments by department and I would go out and check each of the departments. But if there's a department code that doesn't exist, and I went from my department records and said, show me, these are my genuine departments, show me all of the people who work in those departments, 
and let me go and check them. That's not the same thing as saying these are all of the people who got paid. Show me all of the departments that they work in. You come up with two totally different results. I had a, an example um, some years back when I was dealing with a, a medical insurance company. And the problem was that the computer software they were using had been written for them as a package by a third party. And the third party had unrestricted access into their systems in case they needed to fix anything at any time. Now this thing was producing medical aid type checks going out for payments. And this outside contractor had unrestricted access to go in there and do anything they wanted. So I said, listen, how do you know that when you get a check out that it's valid, it's for a valid transaction? He said, ah, now, our external auditors picked us up on that a couple of years back. And what we do is we take all of the valid transactions and we take a statistically valid sample of them and we then compare them to the checks. Now, do you see anything wrong with that? They're taking the authorized transactions and comparing them to the checks. What are they doing? They're saying for every authorized transaction, a check is produced. They are not saying for every check produced, there is an authorized transaction. For two years, they had been checking it the wrong way around and saying everything's OK. We did one check and said, take a statistically valid sample from the checks and check it back to the authorized transactions. Unfortunately, because we had um, idea, we were able to say, forget a statistically valid sample. Take all of the checks and compare them all back to the original authorized transactions. And lo and behold, there were a couple of checks where there was no transaction. Someone had gone in, whether it was an insider, whether it was the supplier, hard to say because they had virtually no internal controls over access, so anyone could go in and do anything. But someone was generating checks from unauthorized transactions. And it's as simple as that. And it's as easy to pick up as that. If you look for a match and you find something's missing, you know you've got a problem. OK. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take our fields, and I'm now going to generate a new field. So I'll go back into my data. I've got my data. I don't want to look at the unauthorized files or fields. And we can see credit limit. I'm going to generate a new field because we're coming up to the year end and we want to have new credit limits. So I'm going to go in on my uh, data, down to my manipulation. I've got all of these fields now from both files. So now I can say I want to append a new field. And my new field is going to be called new limit. It's a virtual numeric field. Okay. Because it's a virtual field, there is no length. It automatically calculates it. But it will have decimal places, and it will have two decimal places. Now, what is that virtual field? If I click on parameter, that takes me back into my equation editor. And my new limit is going to be my old credit limit times 1.1. I'm going to give all of my customers a 10% increase in their credit limit. So when I'm happy with that, I'll give it the big green tick. And I'm going to call it, I'm going to give it a description, which is updated credit limit. And I'll say OK on that. It tells me again that making changes to the database through field manipulation can cause anything based on that field. Now remember what's happening here. 
it's not changing the live data and you can see immediately the new credit limit. Well you can't actually because the new credit limit is stuck over initially on the right hand side and because it's in blue you can tell that this is a virtual field okay as opposed to the black this field does not exist it's a virtual field I'm going to move it so I can see the two of them side by side credit limit new credit limit and now what I can do is I can go through there and say how about if the amount is greater than the new limit well I could go through the whole thing I could put that beside the amounts and then go through it and look for anything where that amount isn't equal to that on the other hand I don't have to what I'm looking at at the moment remember is I'm looking at this with a filter on it with that criteria so what I'll do is I'll take that criteria off clear it I'm now looking at the whole file again so now I've got 943 records to go through to check that's that's quite a lot of records what I can do instead is I can go into my data and say again I want to extract but this time I'm going to go and do a data extraction based on the exceeded having exceeded a specific credit limit. Okay. So I'm going to say go in and do a direct extraction. I'm going to call it exceed credit limit. And I'm going to go into my equation editor and say it's going to exceed it when the amount sum is greater than my new limit. Now what's that going to tell me? It's going to tell me I'm in the wrong file because I don't have amount sum. I hope everyone picked that one up. Why don't I have amount sum? Because I'm in custom and balances. I need to get into those summarized transactions. There's my amount sum. Okay. Happy? So I need to go and find out if my amount sum is greater than my new credit limit. But right away we've got a problem because I don't have my new credit limit. So I'm going to have to go back into my field manipulation and add a field. And this time, it's going to be a virtual numeric. And it's going to be my credit limit, new limit. The two decimal places. But I've got a problem because I don't have my credit limit on this file. My credit limit is on the other file. Can you see the problem? My new limit is sitting in my customer balances and my summarized transactions don't have that on it. So how am I going to get around that one? Well, there's a very easy way. I'm going to go back into my analysis and I'm going to summarize. And I'm going to summarize this time based on my customer, customer number, 
and I'm looking at sales, so I want customer number, and I want to total up credit limits for each customer. Will that make sense? No, it's not going to make sense, because what it's going to do is it's going to total those customer numbers. So, how am I going to get that amount sum? How do I get my amount sum into that field? I've got it here. Sorry. I've got it here with my new limit. I need to extract a file. And I'm going to extract not on a direct from this, but based on a key value. And the key values I don't have. So it's not going to work from that way. It's at this point that the auditor typically is tearing out their hair and saying, where the hell do I go from here? Well, it's fairly straightforward because we still need to get that information. We're in the correct file. We've got the new limit. We've got the amounts. But we need that amount sum. So we need to tie that summarized information which is by customer. Funnily enough, it's by customer. How do I tie those two together? Well, we've already done that. We can go in and file, and we can join databases. We know that. And the database that we're going to join, let me go back in and pick up my customer balances. I want to join to that my secondary database which in this case is going to come from my sum of transactions. This time I only want where there are matches. So if I say OK, I've got to have a key. So what am I going to select? Oops. I've got the fields on here, and I've got the fields on here. Remember the problem that we had before? where we had our customer number was character. And on the secondary one, our fields, our customer number. What is our customer number on this particular one? If I tell it to match, I'm going to match the customer number on this one with the customer number is numeric again. Do we have a numeric on there? No, we don't. So, once again, what I have to do is go back into my summarized one and take my data, manipulate my data, and change my customer number to character. Now I can go back in and say I want to tie my two databases together. I'll take all of the fields from there. I'll take my secondary database will be those summarized transactions. I'm going to match this time my alphabetic customer number to my customer number. I only want matches so now I have them all together and again if I look over here I can see my amount sum 
and we now have customer number two. So we've got customer, cu customer number, customer number one, customer number two from the three different files. So now I'm in a position where I can say I want to go into my data, extract, and do a direct extract. And I'm going to extract it where my down at the bottom here, amount sum is greater than my credit limit, but not the credit limit. We want to check it against the new credit limit. I'm happy with that filter, and I'm going to call it exceeds credit limit. And here we have the ones where we've got our new limit. Now five of them have got zero, because these are the ones where we did not, in fact, have an authorized customer. One of them is genuine. And our new credit limit is 33,000. The original credit limit was 30,000. What's wrong? Well, I can go in and I can have a look at my field manipulation again. And let me go and look at my new credit limit. There's my new limit. What was the parameter for it? Because somewhere in here, I'm going to have to go in and change it. I've got my virtual field. But I didn't mark, multiply by 10, by, by 1.1, I multiplied it by 11. So if I want to change that, I'm going to have to take that one and delete it. Sorry, I'm in the wrong one. Cancel. my fault, I multiplied it with the wrong thing. But you can see there that the amount is greater than the new limit, even when it's multiplied by 11, instead of by 1.1. If I go back to my summarized, whoops, sorry, my summarized transaction there, and have a look at the new limit in here, and down here we have a new limit. And you can see there, this multiply by, beg your pardon, is multiplied by 1.1. Why has it come out at 11? Interesting. What we have got is we've got something that needs to be checked out. That went to 4.4. That went to 22. That's correct. We know that that one was originally sitting the credit limit of, ah, 30, I beg your pardon, 30,000, 33,000. What's wrong? There's no comma. So what does that tell us? It tells us never believe what the first printout tells you particularly if it's what you expect to see. So again, we're in a situation where we have extracted information. We had a situation where we had to create an extra join to get the field that we wanted into a three-way tie with our database before we could actually do that. OK. And you will find yourself in that situation from time to time, where you're looking at one field and you're saying, hang on a second, the one I'm looking for is, is not there, it's somewhere in here. I want that new limit, but I don't have that number of records. 
So I need to get it from somewhere. Where the hell do I get it from? And you're going to have to go back and say, well, which file is it in? How do I tie these two files together so that I can pick up the data from the three different files, put them together, and then do my analysis? Everyone happy? Okay, I've taken you through a fairly complex one in order to get that message across. You don't allow yourself to be stuck. If the data is in there, there's a way to get to it. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to move back onto this and take you to a particular slide. Simply because I want to show you the pretty graph that's on it, because it makes a case for me. And that's it there. The reason I've gone on to that is because if you've printed yours out in black, you won't read it. Now what? In the middle, we're sitting with the idea. What can we do with it? We've looked at uh, tying files together, getting the right field in the right format to tie those files together so that we can get the correct information that we want to analyze. And it may not be there, and it may not be easy to come across, but we can do it. So now, what we want to do is look at what else can we do. Well, we can go check calculations. We can look for any exceptional items. We've done checking our calculations. We've done our identifying our exceptional items where they exceeded that credit limit. We can do all kinds of analytical review. We can search for text in multiple fields and files. We can cross-match data between fields and systems. And we can do the one that perhaps is the most common one for the auditors, testing for completeness by looking for gaps and looking for duplicates. So let's take a look for gaps and duplicates. OK. I'm going to close down that file. I'm going to close down my summarized transaction file. I'm going to come into my sales transaction file, because this is where I want to look for duplicates, and I want to look for missing transactions. Very, very common technique for auditors. It could be duplicate invoices, it could be duplicate checks, it could be duplicate purchase orders, it could be duplicate employee numbers, it could be anything that we want to look for duplicated. In this case, we're going to look for duplicate invoices, so I've picked my sales transaction file, and I'm going to go into analysis, and now I'm going to look for duplicate key. And what I want to do with my duplicate key is detect them. I could say give me everything except duplicates. I could say give me only the duplicates. My output file will be duplicate invoices. And I'm going to have to tell it duplicate based on what? Well, it can be duplicate based on invoice number. I'm happy with that. I can set the field. And I can set the direction. Do I want it ascending or descending? It's going to be based on a new index. So I'll tell it OK. I want to output the duplicate records only. So I'm going to say, uh, sorry, output the duplicate records. So I'm going to say OK. And there they are there. We've got duplicate invoice numbers on different dates for different customers from different salesmen with different visas. Or P Amex. So what we've actually got here is we've got a situation, possibly, where different salesmen are using the same invoice numbers to process transactions. Why? I don't know why. I'm going to have to go and check. Again, I've got 350. Again, it's two different salesmen. Right now, I would say that's probably a mistake off the top of my head. If I found it with the same salesman, I would be starting to worry. Why is the one salesman processing the same invoice number to two different customers at the same time? Is there a fraud going on? Is something going into his back pocket? When I'm happy with that, it's only going to be after I've made inquiry. In the same way, 
I can go back into my sales transactions, but this time I'm going to look for gaps. Will I find gaps missing invoices? I don't know. So I'll go in and this time I'm going to go for gap detection. And again I'm going to use my invoice numbers. I'm going to call it this time um, missing invoice numbers. And I'm going to say OK. It says the rerun stream is not available. What is it telling me? Well, I'm looking at the data. I've got my sales transactions. I want to go into my data. I'm looking for my duplicates. Duplicate key. Sorry, I'm looking for gaps. I beg your pardon. I'm looking for gaps on the invoice number. I'm going to call it my missing invoice numbers. I'm going to create a result and that's what my result is going to be called. It already exists in the database. Provide a name that doesn't already exist, that's because I've already done it. Missing numbers two. And I've got the two coming out where I'm missing invoice numbers. Sorry. But I'm missing it. And you can see it says from invoice number that to invoice number that. So there's only one number missing and the number missing is that number. Let's put commas in because it says it's thousand field but it's not actually, it's just the invoice number. If I look at it on my print preview, I can see there are only two gaps. Those are the missing numbers. When I'm happy with it, I can close it down and go back into my data. My data, there's my duplicate numbers. I'm back in my sales. And if I want to, I can look back at my missing numbers. OK. Everyone happy? Excellent, because it's time for another polling question. Okay, Richard, and the next polling question, and I believe this is question number five. Yep. When virtual fields are created, they appear on the data area on the left, on the right, in blue on the left, in red on the left. Go ahead and register your response. And a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via the chat box, and uh, I will see that uh, Richard answers those. Well, you might see that he tries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tries to answer them. And we now have all of our votes. And what's the correct answer, Richard? Well, they're in blue, but they're not on the left, they're on the right. So the only choice you've got is number two. So, okay, on the right. Okay, that's a trick question. That's a trick question. Okay. So we will go ahead and hide those, and you can carry on. As you can see, if I go back onto my my join, no, I joined it and I moved it so that we had um, that particular one on in the middle, but it came out on the right hand side in blue. Okay. Happy, thrilled and excited, I can tell. Let's go and take our sales 
And instead of looking at our extract in that way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an extraction from my data, but this time I'm going to extract based on key value. And the key value that I want to look at is based on the payment type in ascending order. Now I don't have payment type on here. Why? I should have. I've got it there. So if I go into my data and I want to extract based on my key values, it's telling me we don't have those as existing keys. If I look at my fields, I've got pay type, and they're all included. If I look at my groups, there are no groups found because I haven't picked any up from there. So I'm going to have to go in here and create a new field. And my new field is going to be based on my pay type in ascending order. And another new field will have our product code in ascending order. But now I've got all of these other ones which I really want. So what I can do is I can go into my invoice number and delete that key and say OK. Let me cancel out of that and go back and do it again so that you can see what's happening. I went into uh, my data and I said I want to extract based on key values. And when I looked, there are no existing keys because I've taken off um, that invoice number. I can go and create keys with a little box at the side of it. There's my invoice number. I don't want that one, so I can delete that. But I want to add in my pay type in ascending order and my product code in ascending order. Okay, and I can see there I've got Amex product code 1, Amex for product code 2, Amex for product code 3, etc. Now the ones I'm interested in, there's only a couple of them, so I'll clear all of them out except the ones I want. And I'll pick Visa with product codes 5 and 6. Why 5 and 6? Because I chose 5 and 6. Okay. That's the only reason for 5 and 6. And if I say OK now, there's all the Visa transactions for 5. And further down, all the Visa transactions for 6. And in actual fact, we don't have any for 6. Because it's only picked up 5. So I will close that one down. And let me do that extraction again. Key value extraction. Based on my product code and my payment type. Clear them all. Five and six, which is what I didn't do last time. Once again, very easy to make a mistake. And in this case, guess what? There's no mistake because there are no product code six. Or is there? Because what we can do is we can search for that. We could sort that into an order, which is product code ascending, or we could sort it into product code descending. When we sort it into product code descending, we have no sixes. Ascending, we have no sixes. So we're happy that we don't actually have any sixes on that. OK. Last one that we're going to do 
is direct extraction based on a particular criteria. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my sales, and you can see I've got transaction dates on there. The question is, has anything been processed on a Sunday? Because that could be a problem. In certain jurisdictions, selling, for example, liquor on a Sunday is against the law. So if one of those items that we're selling, one of those product codes, let's say product code 5, happens to be liquor, we've got a problem. So I'm going to go into my data, and I'm going to extract. And this time, I'm going to go for a key view extraction. OK? Sorry, I beg your pardon. Let me cancel out on that. I'm looking at the wrong place here. I'm going to go in extraction and I'm going, whoops, I'm going to go for a direct extraction. Now my mouse is fighting me. Okay. And what I'm going to call it is I'm going to call it Sunday extractions. Now, I want Sunday. There's nothing in there that tells me that it's Sunday. But I can go in on my equation editor. And over in the middle, you'll see we've got a whole pile of different at functions, all character, etc. I'm going to go into date and time. And you'll see there's one in there called DOW, day of the week. And by using an at day of the week, I can place in there the actual transaction date. And I'll say that if the transaction date day of the week is equal to 1, I know that's a Sunday because it starts with Sunday as 1 and rolls through. And if I tell it I'm happy with that and say OK, then it's picked up 30 records. And if anyone wants to get out a calendar, you should find that all of those are Sunday. OK. And it's as simple as that to pick out. For example, you might want to find someone who's putting in overtime for a particular date, which was a public holiday, Easter weekend. Who's been put processing overtime on Easter weekend? And it's as simple as that to go in and do a direct, uh, sorry, a key value extract, and the key value in this case would be day of the week. And I can say, show me when the day of the week equals that date, or I can say, show me, um, sorry, direct extract. I keep saying key value. Show me when the day of the week is equal to Friday, or show me when the date equals that particular date, or whatever I am interested in in particular. OK, your final polling question. OK, Richard, and we will launch the polling, polling question. When extracting a day of the week, a Tuesday would be A1, A2, A3, or A4. And it seems like the appropriate answer would be A3. The appropriate answer should be 3, unless they changed the order of the days. And that, and that is what our attendees said, so they're spot on. I will go ahead and I will hide, hide those and that brings us, And that brings us to the end of this particular webinar. Okay. Now what we've seen is that you can use IDEA to extract information. If it's not on the file the way you think it is, but it's on there somewhere. There's a way of getting it together. If it's there and you can get it together,
but it's not telling you what you want it to tell you, there's a way of handling that as well. Now, Paul... Uh, as far as the supplemental... Sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Paul actually said he got an overflow error when he tries that. I'm not sure Paul... Uh, tried what? That's what I'm trying to determine. Maybe Paul could clarify when you got the overflow error, and we'll get Richard to answer that for you. If prior not, prior, in, in prior to the at DOW topic. Okay. Prior to that. Right. So we were looking at that time. It was when we were doing our key value extraction. Ah, okay. okay. So he gets an overflow so error. Sales, you're getting an overflow error. What we were doing with it was going in on our sales transactions. We were going in looking at, let's see if I can get a, myself an overflow error. Data extraction key value. Whoops. Extraction key value. Okay. And in looking at it, we were looking for the keys. Now at the moment, I've got pay type ascending and product code ascending because that's what I set it up for. But I could delete that. Let me clear all. Bring them up and clear all. I'm still sitting with it. Okay. That's because I've got it there. Let me delete it from here. Delete the index. Okay, I'm sitting with no index on it now. So this is where you should be with the raw information. If I go in on data extract and go into my key values, I should find there are no key values. So I can now go in and say I want, I could delete that key or I can simply change it to my pay type in ascending order. Click in for another one and give it the product code in ascending order. And I've got all of these. Now I only want the bottom two. So if I say clear, well let me try it with include all and see if I can get something strange happen to me. Nope. I'm getting them all. So I wonder, Richard, if an overflow error would uh, would basically be dependent on the on the machine, you know, on your computer. Not uh, necessarily the machine, but it could be it could be the operating system um, and the version of ID that's being used. Okay. Now, what uh, what he's saying. He says, as soon as he clears all but the bottom two and clicks OK, he gets the error. He gets an overflow okay, error when he tries understand. tries that. But he understands the principle. OK. So I think. Um, I haven't come across a, an overflow error. I will play with it until now, I can try and get it to work. And if I can, then I'll, I'll get you to send him an email. <laughs> True. Now the benefit of, of having the, the recording, and you will all get the recording for this, is that you can go back and you can go over this again. You can, yeah. uh, as they say, you can play it again. So, play it again, Sam. Play it again, Sam. So basically, uh, you know, that's the beauty of having these uh, recorded for everybody. So continue on, Richard. Okay, I'm just going to talk in terms of the uh, supplemental information that's available. Okay. These are some sources of information that you might want to look at uh, to download and to take you through what uh, obviously you're going to be getting the you've got the um, handouts and this is already on it. As far as the next webinar is concerned what we're going to be looking at is designing a report using the report assistance and putting together the headings defining breaks within reports so that you can have it breaking for subtotals, etc. Getting 
report breaks, getting grand totals, getting headers and footers, and then finally previewing and printing a report. Now when I say printing a report, I will not actually print the report because as I say, it looks a bit stupid when I switch on the camera and just hold up the report. <laughs> okay, so that's what we're going to be covering on the next one. So, if you have any questions and you wish to answer them, uh, ask them now, by all means. If you don't, if it occurs to you later, if it occurs to you when you're going through the uh, video again and you think, how the hell did he do that? By all means, send through an email and we will attempt to answer them as quickly as possible. Well, very Bear good. Bear in mind that at the moment I'm in Africa and there is a time lag. <laughs> okay. So at the moment over here, it's 7 p.m. So if you send me an email, it may be the next day before I can reply. Excellent. Well, thank you all for joining us today, and thank you for those questions. And, and thanks, Richard, for uh, this uh, overview and conducting basic data analysis with IDEA. Uh, I learned a lot uh, during the, uh, the presentation, and I hope that everybody else did as well. Uh, the purpose of our Training Without Travel webinars is to provide you with high-quality, low-cost, online alternative training solutions covering timely topics with value-added resources and tools that you can use in your job. We bring the world's best subject matter experts directly to your desktop with timely information. As Richard mentioned, the next webinar in this series will be reporting using IDEA. For information on the remaining webinars in this series and other Training Without Travel opportunities, please visit www.auditnet.org. Thank you, Richard, and to everybody that's uh, in attendance, have a great day. Thank you, Jim, and best of luck with IDEA. Thank you. Bye-bye.